On May 29, 2005, 18-year-old Natalie Holloway embarked on a mission to create lasting memories on her final day in Aruba. Unfortunately, what was meant to be the most perfect date of her life quickly transformed into a nightmarish ordeal when she mysteriously vanished from the vibrant Caribbean islands. Born on October 21, 1986, in Clinton, Mississippi, Natalie later relocated to Mountain Brook, Alabama. She was the eldest of two siblings with a younger brother named Matthew. Natalie grew up in a tight-knit and affectionate family. Her parents, Beth Holloway and David Holloway, were high school sweethearts who tied the knot in the 1980s. However, their differences eventually led to their separation in 1993, after 13 years of marriage. Beth Holloway took on the responsibility of raising their two children single-handedly and did an exceptional job. In 2000, she married George Jug Twitty, an Alabama businessman, and moved with her children to Mountain Brook, Alabama. Despite the divorce, David remained a pillar of support for his family, ensuring that his children never felt abandoned. Natalie flourished in a nurturing and encouraging environment, excelling academically. She attended Mountain Brook High School in Birmingham, Alabama, where she was recognized as an honor student actively involved in various extracurricular activities. As the academic prodigy of the Holloway family, Natalie desired to embark on a graduation trip with her friends before commencing college. Although initially hesitant, her parents eventually agreed, witnessing their daughter's remarkable achievements. Natalie had aspirations of pursuing a pre-med degree at the University of Alabama, courtesy of a full scholarship. Prior to her college journey, she was determined to make the most of this trip and was filled with anticipation. On May 26, 2005, Natalie, accompanied by her 125 classmates and seven chaperones from Mountain Brook High, arrived on the picturesque Caribbean island of Aruba. Once they arrived at the Holiday Inn, all of them decided to stay. The students were given the freedom to enjoy themselves without any supervision. Natalie and her friends spent the next few days soaking up the sun, snorkeling and partying at the local clubs and bars until the early hours of the morning. This was Natalie's first taste of independence, and being of legal drinking age, it worked to her advantage. The group frequently visited popular spots like Carlos and Charlie's nightclub and the Excelsior Casino, both conveniently connected to the Holiday Inn. On May 29, 2005, the final day of their trip to Aruba, Natalie and her friends were at the casino near the blackjack table when a Dutch stranger approached them. He introduced himself as Geran van der Sloot, a student around the same age as Natalie, who was also visiting from Holland and staying nearby. They hit it off and engaged in conversation. Natalie and her friends planned to go to Carlos and Charlie's, so they invited Joran to join them. Just before closing time, Joran arrived at the club and took Natalie to the back bar to buy her a few drinks. Unbeknownst to Natalie, her drink was spiked with a substance known as Liquid X, which is odorless and colorless. This substance is commonly used by attackers to sedate their victims before taking advantage of them. Liquid X only requires a few drops to take effect. The bartender seemed to recognize Joran, which was unusual, but Natalie didn't pay much attention to it. The drug soon began to affect Natalie, and she quickly became intoxicated. Joran fabricated a story about sharks near the lighthouse and convinced Natalie to accompany him to the beach. Joran arranged for his friend's car to be waiting outside the club for him. He guided Natalie to the back seat of a silver-gray Honda driven by Deepak while Sadish Kalpo sat in the front seat. Natalie's friends watched as she left with an unfamiliar Dutch man, paying no attention to their concerns. Little did they know this would be the last time anyone would see her. On May 30th, 2005, when the students from Mountain Brook High School were preparing to board their plane back home, Natalie was nowhere to be found. The first call was made to Beth Holloway, informing her that her daughter was missing and had missed her flight. Filled with fear, Beth boarded a private jet owned by a friend and arrived in Aruba within 12 hours.
She immediately went to the local police station, where Natalie's disappearance had been reported, and urged them to initiate an investigation. Beth insisted on reviewing the security tapes from the previous night, accompanied by the casino manager. It was then that she discovered her daughter leaving the club with Joran. Inquiring about Joran, she learned that he was a regular at the casino and had connections throughout Aruba's gambling establishments. Joran was known for his reckless behavior, involving gambling, drugs, and engaging in suspicious activities. Despite living in his family's estate, he resided in his own private guest house. Further investigation into his background revealed a disturbing pattern. Joran allegedly targeted women on their last night in Aruba. He would isolate them from their friends, drug them, and then subject them to physical assault in his guest house, showing no remorse. Joran had faced multiple accusations of aggravated assault, with victims claiming he took advantage of them while they were under the influence of drugs. However, none of these allegations resulted in any consequences for him. He had meticulously planned his actions, leaving no trace back to himself. Finally, around 3 a.m. the next day, Beth managed to convince the police to accompany her to the Van der Sloot residence. There, she was met by Paul van der Sloot, Joran's father, who immediately denied any involvement of his son in the case. Joran swiftly joined the conversation, accompanied by his friends Deepak and Sadish. When Beth confronted them about Natalie being last seen with Joran at the bar, he claimed that they had only gone for a few drinks and later dropped her off at the hotel. Paul, being a judicial official in Aruba, immediately intervened and instructed his son to cease any further interaction. This professional background provided Joran with a shield, allowing him enough time to eliminate any incriminating evidence. Unfortunately, the police offered little assistance, leaving Beth with no choice but to return to the station. The hotel's CCTV footage contradicted Joran's claims, as none of the cameras captured Natalie being dropped off at the inn. The following morning, David Holloway arrived in Aruba, desperate to locate his missing daughter. Despite 48 hours having passed since Natalie's disappearance, the police seemed hesitant to believe Joran's involvement in the case. The assigned officers repeatedly assured Beth that her daughter would reappear at any moment. Meanwhile, they began speculating that Natalie may have been under the influence of drugs or had simply run away. With mounting desperation, David Holloway organized a ground search, with more friends and family members joining them in Aruba. As news of Natalie's disappearance reached a local media channel in Alabama, news crews and reporters flooded the island. Every news outlet, magazine, and newspaper featured Natalie on their front pages. Prominent channels such as the New York Times conducted extensive interviews with Beth Holloway, further raising public awareness of Natalie's situation. David received calls from other families who had experienced similar incidents of their daughters going missing in Aruba. However, they were advised to abandon these cases due to the lack of leads. As public pressure intensified, the investigating officers brought in Joran and the Calpo brothers for questioning. During the initial interrogation by Araban authorities, Joran van der Sloot and the Calpo brothers, Deepak and Sadish, claimed that they had taken Natalie Holloway to California Lighthouse near Arashi Beach on the northwest tip of the island to observe sharks. According to their statement, they dropped her off at the hotel around 2 a.m. on the morning of May 30, 2005. Subsequently, on June 5th, two former hotel security guards were arrested after Joran and the Calpo brothers alleged that they had witnessed the guards approaching Natalie outside the hotel before driving away. The young men themselves were apprehended on June 9th and detained on potential charges of first- or second-degree murder and kidnapping resulting in death. Aruban Attorney General Karen Janssen clarified that the authorities had hoped that one of the suspects would provide conclusive evidence, which is why they were not immediately taken into custody. On June 14th, the beach was thoroughly searched, followed by a search of Duran's residence the next day during which investigators confiscated two vehicles, computers, and cameras. While some citizens criticized the delayed response of the Aruban authorities, 
Others argued that it aided in the accumulation of circumstantial evidence. The security guards were subsequently released on June 18th, and one of them informed the police that a Calpo brother had confided in him while they were both incarcerated. The guard revealed that the brothers had not taken Natalie to the hotel, but had instead left her with Joran at a beach near the hotel. Paul van der Sloot, Joran's father, was also questioned by the police and arrested on June 22nd. Additionally, reports emerged regarding the arrest of Steve Gregory Crows, a DJ on a party boat who may have had some connection to the case. Both Crows and Paul were released on June 26th. Sadish Kalpo admitted to providing false information to the police during his initial trial and subsequently altered his statement, claiming that he and Deepak had indeed dropped off Joran and Natalie at the hotel, and that was the last they had seen of them. In the meantime, a gardener at the Aruba Racket Club provided a sworn statement to the police, stating that he witnessed all three men in a car near the club around 2.30 a.m., contradicting the Kalpoia's claim that they were already home. As each statement emerged, the case became more convoluted, and there were still no signs of Natalie. Despite the exhaustive efforts of the Aruban Police Department, Dutch Marines, Federal Bureau of Investigation agents, and numerous locals who meticulously searched every inch of the land, no evidence was found. However, a volunteer group took matters into their own hands and dispatched divers and sonar equipment on June 25th, hoping to uncover any clues. It wasn't until six weeks after Natalie's disappearance that her family decided to offer a reward of $200,000 for her safe return, with an additional $100,000 reward for any information leading to the resolution of the case. By the end of July, the reward was increased to $1 million if Natalie returned home alive. Beth remained in Araba for a total of two months, departing just a few weeks before the Calpos, who had been previously released on July 4th, were rearrested on August 26th. However, the brothers in Duran were all released again by September 3rd. In late August, divers from the Aruba Search Team and Rescue Foundation conducted another search after receiving a tip about human bones detected by a radar machine approximately a mile off the coast. Unfortunately, their efforts yielded no results. In March 2006, ten months after Natalie's disappearance, Aruban authorities revealed that witnesses had informed them about her heavy drinking and possession of drugs that night, although no one claimed to have seen her consuming any substances. Deputy Chief of Police Gerald Dompig stated, We strongly believe that she may have gone into shock or experienced some adverse reaction due to the combination of alcohol and possibly other drugs, either voluntarily taken or administered to her, resulting in her collapse. With the belief that she had passed away, the search teams focused their efforts on the beach where Duran claimed to have last seen her, as well as a nearby salt pond in search of forensic evidence. Throughout this time, Duran's account of events continued to change. He found the media attention he received quite intriguing and cleverly used it to his advantage. Duran frequently contacted news channels, claiming to have new evidence related to the case in order to extort money to fuel his gambling addiction. Duran van der Sloot was born on August 6, 1987, in Arnhem, Netherlands, to parents Paulus van der Sloot and Anita van der Sloot Hugen. He was recognized as an honor student and a star athlete at the International School of Aruba. His father, an attorney, was in the process of becoming a judge when Natalie Holloway disappeared. Watson, one of Natalie's close friends, recalled her first encounter with Duran. I remember he's really tall. I remember looking at him thinking, Oh, who's that guy? You know, he's hanging out with my friends, she continued. I wasn't really suspicious. I mean, he's going to come out with us later. Joran was easily identified by Holiday Inn staff as a regular who targeted young female tourists. He spent three months in jail, but was released without any charges. A judge determined that there was insufficient evidence to keep him detained. Towards the end of 2007, he and the Calpo brothers were arrested again, but once more, they were released without any consequences. 
Joran traveled freely around the world, residing in Thailand for a brief period. Engaging in suspicious activities, he managed to evade capture. He frequently discussed the case, seemingly enjoying the fame it brought him, but his temper was quick to flare. During a sit-down interview with Dutch crime reporter Peter de Vries in January 2008, he threw a glass of wine in Peter's face when questioned about his credibility. In November 2008, CNN reported that Arabin authorities had two new leads to pursue— Initially, a witness came forward claiming to have seen Paul van der Sloot on the night of May 29, 2005. He informed the authorities that he was at home sleeping at 7 a.m. on the night in question, while his son was near a pond on the island at 4 a.m. on May 30, 2005. According to the witness, a young man, soaked from the waist down and wearing only one shoe, was seen running from the pond towards a fast food restaurant. Shortly after, an older man in a red jeep accompanied the young man, passing by about ten minutes later. Another tip came from Joran's ex-girlfriend, who claimed that he had once said to her, You never know, you might be on the beach with someone who can dispose of a body. In their quest to find Natalie, the family enlisted the help of private investigator Tim Miller, who spent nearly a year going door-to-door -door in Aruba, often accompanied by David Holloway. On Natalie's birthday, October 21, 2005, they even searched the landfills in Aruba, digging through the garbage in hopes of finding any clues. However, it was the deputy police chief who suggested that they shift their search to the sea, as a fisherman's hut had recently been broken into, and items such as a fish trap and tools that could be used to weigh down a body were stolen. Entrepreneur Louis Schaefer, who had been closely following the case, offered to finance an expedition to search the ocean floor within a specific radius. In November 2007, a boat named Persistence set sail for Aruba. On December 24th, they discovered what appeared to be a fishing trap approximately 90 feet below the surface. Five days later, on December 29th, they deployed a remote-operated vehicle to investigate further and spotted what seemed to be a skull. On December 30th, a diver from the boat joined two Aruban police divers, but unfortunately they did not find anything related to Natalie. Despite numerous leads and witnesses emerging from time to time, they all ultimately led to dead ends. In the early months of 2008, David received a message from someone named Marcos, who claimed to have insider information regarding Natalie's disappearance. According to Marcos, Drug runners had been paid to dispose of Natalie's body at sea, but instead they took her remains to Nicaragua and concealed them on land. Intrigued by this revelation, David traveled to Nicaragua to meet with Marcos in person. Marcos offered to accompany David to the hiding spot using a GPS tracker to search for Natalie's remains. According to official reports, Marcos contacted David later, claiming to have found Natalie. He described her wrapped in a blanket, but unfortunately her body had decomposed. Marcos insisted that they had to place her in two ice chests. After this incident, Marcos vanished without a trace, never to be heard from again. In February 2010, Paul van der Sloot, Joran's father, unexpectedly passed away from a heart attack, leaving Joran in a state of uncertainty. In March of the same year, Joran reached out to John Kelly, the Holloway family's attorney, using the pseudonym J.P. Sanders. In a desperate plea, Duran claimed to know the whereabouts of Natalie Holloway. Duran's email expressed his desire to come clean, stating that his father's death had removed any reason for him to hide the truth. He offered to assist Natalie's family, but requested a substantial sum of $250,000 in return. Joran proposed that he would disclose what happened to Natalie and where she could be found, allowing Beth to bring her home. After receiving Beth's permission, John Kelly arranged a meeting with Joran in Aruba, agreeing to provide an initial payment of $25,000. During their meeting, Joran asserted that he knew the location of Natalie's body. When John inquired about the consequences if they didn't pay him, Joran callously replied that Beth could wait another five years without any remorse. Faced with this distressing situation, the Holloway family sought assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
They devised a plan to trick Joran into believing he would receive payment, intending to catch him engaging in wire fraud. This would, at the very least, provide legal grounds to detain him. John and Joran crossed paths once again, and this time John transferred a total of $25,000 to him. Upon receiving the payment, Joran guided John to a house near Aruba Racket Club, where he claimed to have hidden Natalie's remains in a freshly poured foundation before the house was constructed. Joran alleged that he had been with Natalie on the beach that night. According to his account, he wanted to leave, but Natalie resisted, leading to a heated argument. In a fit of anger, he pushed her, causing her to hit her head and lose a significant amount of blood, resulting in her immediate death. John remained skeptical about the overall credibility of Joran's story, but it turned out that Joran initially concealed the body on the beach with his father's assistance before burying her elsewhere. The house Joran led John to had not undergone any construction since 2010. Authorities deemed Joran's account insufficiently credible to issue an arrest warrant. Both John and Joran stayed in contact until May 25th, with Joran claiming he would surrender himself. However, instead of doing so, he fled to Peru with the extorted money. On June 30th, 2010, a federal grand jury indicted Joran on charges of wire fraud and extortion. Upon arriving in Peru, Joran reverted to his previous behavior. He approached 21-year-old college student Stephanie Flores at the Atlantic City Casino in Lima, Peru. Surveillance footage revealed that they played poker together for approximately one to two hours. Subsequently, Stephanie exchanged some chips for cash and accompanied Joran to the TAC hotel, where he collected his room key from the front desk. At around 5.33 a.m., they were last seen ascending the stairs before entering room 309. On May 30, 2010, at 8.36 a.m., Joran was observed locked out of his room and contacted the front desk for assistance. Twenty minutes later, he left alone, carrying only a backpack. The television in the room remained on, and he instructed the clerk, Don't disturb my girl, before departing. Two days later, hotel staff discovered Stephanie's severely beaten body inside room 309. Stephanie's father, Ricardo Flores, was a well-known entrepreneur and former professional race car driver, which undoubtedly attracted significant attention from the local media. Joran, on the other hand, fled to the south and was eventually apprehended in Chile. He made every effort to alter his appearance, shaving his head and dyeing his hair blonde, as well as discarding most of his clothing. However, Joran chose to keep his laptop, refusing to part with it. Initially, Joran vehemently proclaimed his innocence to the Lima police, but after four days in custody, he finally broke down and confessed to the murder of Stephanie. According to his account, they had gone up to his room to engage in some online gambling. During a brief absence, Joran returned to find Stephanie going through his laptop, discovering information related to Natalie's disappearance. This discovery caused Stephanie to panic and attempt to leave the room, further enraging Joran, ultimately leading to her tragic demise. Stephanie suffered a broken neck and was likely paralyzed minutes before her death. The subsequent autopsy revealed that she was conscious when Joran placed her lifeless body on the floor and briefly left to take a shower. Upon realizing that Stephanie was still alive, he used his shirt to strangle her. Before fleeing the scene, Joran committed one final act of disrespect by positioning Stephanie's deceased body in a suggestive manner before departing. The entire population of the United States was shaken by this event, as history seemed to be repeating itself with another victim, five years later, on the very same day. Beth Holloway, Natalie's mother, was devastated, and finally, Joran faced trial. He was charged with first-degree murder and robbery in Peru, in addition to wire fraud and extortion, as suggested by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Birmingham, Alabama. The defense argued that the crime should be classified as manslaughter, citing Joran's severe psychological trauma resulting from the Natalie Holloway case. However, Joran ultimately pleaded guilty to the murder charges. 
The court handed Duran a 28-and-a-half-year prison sentence in 2012, marking a significant victory for the Holloway family after enduring years of trauma. Beth Holloway made a trip to Peru to visit Duran at Castro Castro Prison in September 2010, where a Dutch documentary crew shed light on his life in one of the world's harshest cells. Beth expressed a sense of liberation, stating, Joran was incarcerated, and this is what I had been striving for over the past five years. This was my goal all along. Joran's imprisonment served as a pivotal moment for the families of the victims, allowing them to finally progress with their lives. In July 2014, Joran was preparing to marry his pregnant Peruvian girlfriend, Lidi Figueroa. Lidi revealed to CBS that she met Joran in 2010 during a visit to another inmate with her cousin. Conjugal visits were permitted at Piedras Gordas, the maximum security prison in northern Lima, where Joran spent his initial years before being moved from Miguel Castro Castro. According to Lidi, her partner had undergone a significant transformation. In August, Joran was relocated to the more isolated Chalapaica prison in the Andes Mountains due to an alleged threat against the warden at Piedras Gordas. Lidi, who gave birth to a daughter in September, claimed that Joran was attacked by a fellow inmate at Chalapaica. However, these accusations were refuted by the director of the Peru National Penitentiary Institute, who labeled her a compulsive liar in an interview. In 2015, Lidi shared a letter from Duran with Fox News Latino, in which he claimed that Stephanie's father had placed a $10,000 bounty on his head. Expressing fear for his life, Duran urged authorities to ensure his safety in prison. By this point, legal authorities and the media had already identified him as a compulsive liar and a sociopath. Duran's lack of remorse, guilt, or fear, combined with the severity of his crime, further solidified the deception of his lies. In June 2023, Duran was extradited to Birmingham to face federal charges of extortion to which he pleaded not guilty. However, in October, he altered his statement and admitted to killing Natalie as part of a plea deal. This resulted in a 20-year prison sentence for extortion and wire fraud, which would run concurrently with his existing term in Peru. Finally, Duran confessed to the horrifying events of May 29, 2005. On the night of Natalie's disappearance, the Calpo brothers left them at the beach after Natalie fell ill. Duran revealed that Natalie had briefly kissed him, but when he made further advances, she fought back and kneed him in self-defense. In a fit of anger, Duran kicked her in the head and then used a cinder block to dispose of her body by dragging her into the ocean. The statute of limitations for murder charges in Aruba is 12 years, and the island's prosecutors have requested access to Duran van der Sloot's files from the U.S. Justice Department before deciding on their next steps. Natalie Holloway's case remains open in Aruba and has become one of the most well-known missing person cases in the U.S. The loss of a family member in a foreign country and the horrifying details of the story have brought forth numerous questions about the actions of both the Arabian Police Department and those associated with Joran. Each individual involved played a role in the tragic disappearance of 18-year-old Natalie, a beloved daughter and promising medical student, whose life was cut short due to negligence. This particular case has sparked outrage and raised concerns about our community's law enforcement and media. The plea of a mother in distress resonated throughout the nation in silence. Yet as of 2024, Natalie's location remains a mystery with no clear path to justice in sight.